Hello, my name is Jamie Ansel, and I am the instructor for Chemistry 162. This will be a walkthrough through the Chapter 13 PowerPoint notes, Part 1 of 2. Chapter 13 is about the properties of mixtures, solutions and colloids, and a variety of subtopics related to those. We'll talk about the different types of solutions, focusing on intermolecular forces and solubility. We'll then talk about how biological macromolecules are related to those intermolecular forces. We'll talk about why substances dissolve, when a solution is being made, then we'll do calculations related to solubility, concentration, collative properties, and we'll end by talking about some basics of colloids. At this time, pause the video and fill in these blanks to review what you should already recall about solutions. Welcome back from your pause. Let's walk through these together. Solutions are homogeneous mixtures of two or more pure substances, meaning that the parts of our solution are uniformly distributed throughout the mixture. There are two major parts to every solution. The part present in the greatest amount is called the solvent, and the part present in the smaller amount is called the solute. I remember this difference because solvent, present in the greater amount, has more letters in the word than solute. The formation of a homogeneous mixture depends on the natural tendency of substances to mix and spread out to increase their disorder, but also the intermolecular forces that occur between the solvent and the solute particles. So far, we've talked about four major intermolecular forces or attractions between molecules. We talked about dispersion forces, dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonds, and the ion-dipole attractive force. Solutions or homogeneous mixtures can be many states of matter. They can be solid, liquid, or gas. The air that we breathe is a homogeneous solution of gases. Solid solutions are referred to as alloys. We talked about a variety in the last chapter. If we take a ratio of the solute to the solution, it is referred to as concentration. And there are many concentration units that can be used to describe a solution. When a solution forms, the solute-solute interactions must break, and the solvent-solvent interactions must break to make room for each other. And when these interactions break, they result in new solvent-solute interactions. Solvation is the process of making a homogeneous mixture. Our solute and solvent are separated to begin with. Here we see water molecules of our solvent and an ionic compound crystal structure of sodium chloride, our solute. As the solution forms, solvation occurs as individual ions are pulled away from the solid crystal and are surrounded by water molecules. You'll notice that the polarity of water has an effect on what side of the water molecule surrounds the ions. The positive end of this dipole of water, where the hydrogens are, are attracted to the anion of chloride. And the oxygen side, or the negative part of the dipole, are attracted to the positive cations. When the ions are separated and spread out through the solution, we call this process hydration. The major points are that the solvent-solvent interactions are overcome, as are the solute-solute interactions, to form new solvent-solute interactions. As the solution is made, the once orderly solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions increase their disorder as new solvent-solute interactions are formed. In addition to the intermolecular forces we discussed in previous chapters, there are even more present than we discussed. Here are some pictures and a list of the different forces. Take a moment to pause the video and identify each of the following in the picture. Welcome back from the pause. Our first interaction, called the ion dipole, is occurring here between the sodium cation and the water molecules. It's called an ion dipole interactive force because there is an ion and a dipole present and they're interacting. Our second force, the hydrogen bond, is not a covalent bond as you would assume, but is in fact an intermolecular force between two molecules. The hydrogen of one polar covalent bond and the lone pair of electrons on another atom in another molecule. Our third intermolecular force is a dipole-dipole interaction, which occurs between two polar molecules. Here we see ethanol, with the positive side over here, inter 
the negative side over here, interacting with the positive side of chloroform. This inner mark of the force is relatively strong. As we go to the other column, we see something called an ion-induced dipole force, where we have an ion, negatively charged chloride, that is near a nonpolar molecule that is usually not a dipole. Due to this negative charge, the positive portions of the molecule are exposed in the hexane, and the negative on the other side for a temporary induced dipole. In addition to an ion dipole being an intermolecular force, dipole-induced dipole is another attractive force. Here we have one occurring between a dipole of water and the nonpolar atom of a xenon. Finally, at the very bottom, we have our last intermolecular force called a dispersion force. Dispersion forces occur between all molecules that have protons and electrons, but they're most notable or significant between two nonpolar compounds like octane and hexane. We can rank these intermolecular forces from strongest to weakest with the ion dipole attractive force being the strongest in most cases, and the weakest intermolecular force being dispersion forces between nonpolar molecules. Take a moment to identify which of these intermolecular forces occur between water and another substance. On this slide, there are three examples of intermolecular forces that occur between water and other substances. We have the ion dipole attractive force, the hydrogen bond, and finally the dipole-induced dipole. Water has all sorts of interesting properties associated with it. One of the coolest things, in my opinion, is something called a hydration shell, which is a when an ionic compound is dissolved in water and the ions are surrounded by water molecules, and they make a very precise, ordered, almost crystalline structure with the water molecules surrounding each ion in a type of bubble or shell. This occurs because the ion dipole attractive forces that are occurring between water and ion are very strong, and the hydrogen bonds still remain between other solvent molecules of water surrounding the ion. As a result of these two intermolecular forces that form, we see a hydration shell. This has the ion in the center with an octahedral arrangement of water molecules around the ion. We can talk about solubility of many different types of compounds and the limitations that occur with solubility. We'll start by talking about methanol, the smallest of the alcohols, and how it is soluble in water. In this picture, we see a small molecule here, this is methanol, with one carbon and one oxygen and a hydrogen. Here we have a polar covalent bond that allows it to make hydrogen bonds with other water molecules that are nearby. As the region of the nonpolar, as the nonpolar region of the molecule increases, the solubility of the substance in water decreases. As you can see in this table, 13.2 from your textbook, we have methanol here with a model of it, as seen in the picture, and it has an infinite solubility in water. As we go from methanol to ethanol, we see an additional carbon attached, full of nonpolar bonds. As we keep going from two carbons to three carbons to four carbons to five carbons, we start to see that the length of this nonpolar region increases. Eventually, we reach a point where the solubility in water has been compromised. This, lar this large nonpolar region means that not all of the molecule will interact with water molecules. As we go from butanol with four carbons down to hexanol with six, this large nonpolar region means the solubility of one hexanol in water is relatively low compared to the smaller molecule of methanol. Take a moment to pause this video to answer these questions. Welcome back from the pause. So you've been asked to choose a solvent that will allow the most solute to dissolve and then explain your reasoning. In number one, we have the solute, sodium chloride, and we have two solvents that we could use, either methanol or propanol. In this case, the solvent that will allow more sodium chloride to dissolve is the sorry, I forgot that. The solvent that will allow the most sodium chloride to dissolve is the methanol. Due to having the smallest nonpolar region, it can make interactions between the OH group of the methanol and the ions of sodium chloride, similar to how water does it. 
In our example number two, the solute, eth solute ethylene glycol has two polar regions on it, an OH group on either side of the molecule. As a result of this, it will dissolve well in a solvent that is also polar. Between these two solvents, water and hexane, water is the most polar and will create hydrogen bonds between the water molecules and the ethylene glycol. We can also discuss how boiling point and solubility are related to each other. Let's look at some examples of gases and their solubility in water. As the intermolecular forces of a substance increase in strength, we wonder what happens to boiling point and then also solubility and why. As we look at this table, 13.3 from your textbook, we have different gases, helium, neon, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, oxygen, and nitrogen monoxide. We can look at their solubility and also their boiling point and wonder what happens to the boiling point of a substance as we increase the strength of the intermolecular forces. So as we increase the intermolecular forces from helium to neon to nitrogen, carbon monoxide having the strongest of those intermolecular forces of the ones we've talked about so far, solubility increases in water because the molecules become more polarizable or more likely to form interactions between water molecules and the gas of interest. Of all these gases, the nitrogen monoxide is, has the largest dipole, so it can interact most with water. In addition to solubility increasing with a more polar molecule, boiling point does as well. For nitrogen monoxide, we have the highest boiling point, meaning the most energy is needed to break the intermolecular forces between the molecule and turn our liquid into a gas. We can also talk about the energy of solution formation when the solvent-solvent interactions break and the solute-solute and form new interactions. We have three processes that we can label enthalpies for. Enthalpy, as a reminder, is the heat associated with a change. So when we break the solute-solute interactions, energy has to be put into our substances to separate them, give them enough kinetic energy. That enthalpy is called the enthalpy of solute. It's abbreviated delta H for solute. It's an endothermic process because energy has to be absorbed by the molecules to separate them enough to break the interaction. Our second type of enthalpy is called breaking, it's called the enthalpy of solvent. And it's all about breaking the solvent-solvent interactions, and this also requires energy. It is endothermic. Finally, while we're breaking two different types of interactions, we're also forming new ones in the solute-solvent interactions. And this is called enthalpy of mixing or the actual mixing of the solute and solvent and the interactions that form as a result. We can abbreviate this delta H mix for mixing. This is an exothermic process. So we have two endothermic processes of breaking interactions and one of an exothermic process where interactions are forming. If we add all three of these together using Hess's law of summation, we can calculate the enthalpy of solution and the energy required to create a solution breaking two different types of interactions and forming new ones. Here are some diagrams representing the enthalpy of making a solution. On the x-axis, we have the process of our mixing, and on the y-axis, we have our enthalpy. We'll begin by talking about an exothermic solution process. In order to break the solvent-solvent interactions, we have to add in or absorb energy called enthalpy of solvent. To break the solute interactions, we have to add in even more energy, called delta H of solvent, solute. And if we add these two things together, we'll get a total amount of energy inputted. As we mix our solute and solvent together and form new interactions, a large amount of energy is released in delta H mix. If we add all three of our enthalpies together, solvent, solute, and mixing, we get an overall exothermic process for enthalpy solution. The formation of some solutions while they are exothermic, can also be endothermic. Here's an example of an endothermic solution process diagram. We still have to add energy to break solvent interactions and solute. And when we mix them together, some energy is released, but not enough to compensate for all of the energy that was inputted to break the solvent-solvent and solute-solute interactions. As a result, the final enthalpy is higher than the initial, giving us a positive enthalpy of solution for an endothermic process. Please pause the video to answer these questions. Welcome back from the pause. I'm now gonna work through the calculation involved for solving all three of the questions from the previous slide. 
We'll begin by talking about what happens when 23 grams of calcium chloride dissolves in water. 1,800 joules of energy is released. And I wonder what the enthalpy of solution is in kilojoules per mole. Because enthalpy always has units of energy per mole, we have to convert our energy unit first into kilojoules and then convert our grams into moles. We'll make a ratio of kilojoules per mole to determine the enthalpy of solution. So the way that we turn grams into moles is using the molar mass. The molar mass of calcium chloride is 110.98 grams per mole. The result of this calculation is that every 23 grams of calcium chloride contains 0 0.207 moles of calcium chloride. One additional sig fig has been kept. We're then going to make a ratio of heat or energy released to the moles of our limiting substance, or calcium chloride. Because energy is being released, our heat value is negative. I took the joules and converted them into kilojoules by dividing by 1,000, and then divided the kilojoules of energy released by the number of moles of our solute. That calculation results in an enthalpy of solution of negative 8.7 kilojoules per mole. For number two, we're going to use our understanding of enthalpy to explain why polar solutes are not soluble in polar solvents. Ultimately, what's going on when a solution does not form is that the enthalpy of mixing is too small or too positive to compensate for the enthalpy necessary to break the solute-solute and solvent-solvent interactions. And number three, when we have one mole of magnesium sulfate and we dissolve it into water, would we use it to make a hot pack or a cold pack? A hot pack or a cold pack is all based on the enthalpy of solution and whether it is an endothermic process or an exothermic process. Information is given about magnesium sulfate but the enthalpy of solute, solvent, and mixing. You'll notice that enthalpy of solute and solvent are both endothermic, while the mixing itself is exothermic. If we add all three together, we'll get enthalpy of solution. So using Hess's law summation, we calculate that the enthalpy of solution is negative 100 kilojoules per mole for magnesium sulfate. This release of energy means that our surroundings are going to heat up as a result of the making of this mixture. This will allow this chemical reaction to be used as an exothermic ray or a hot pack where energy is released by the process of the solution forming. In addition to looking at the solute's point of view, we can also look at how water is changing as a result of solvation. Two major steps are involved in the formation of a solution where water is concerned. The first is that we have to break the solvent interactions, which for water's case is the hydrogen bond. We then form interactions between the solvent and the solute, which is the enthalpy of mixing. Notice that the enthalpy of solute is not involved from water's point of view. We can summarize just the enthalpy associated with water as heat of hydration. We can calculate the enthalpy of hydration by just taking the enthalpy of solvent and adding the enthalpy of mixing, leaving out the solute. The interactions between water and the ion are impacted by a variety of things, but mostly the size and the charge of the ion. You may recall Coulomb's law in its relation to the ionic bond. So based on what we talked about so far, take a moment to pause the video and answer this question. Welcome back from the pause. Now we wonder which ion would have the strongest interactions with water. Our first set contains two cations, a sodium and a magnesium. Due to the additional positive charge of magnesium, it has a greater charge overall, meaning a stronger um, interaction between the magnesium ion and the water molecule. So when we have two ions, one positive one and one positive two, the one with a larger charge will have a stronger interaction with water. Our second set includes two ion, anions, fluoride and bromide. They both have the same charge, but they're going to have different sizes. Fluoride is a smaller molecule, smaller ion, as a result of it having a smaller ion, it can get closer to water molecules, meaning the interaction between the ion and water are greater. Here's another table from your textbook, 13.4. It looks at how the trend of the ionic heats of hydration are related to both the ionic radius and then the enthalpy of hydration. So up at the top, uh, we have group 1A or the alkali metals and the cations that they form. For sodium, um, there's a radius of 100 two picometers for this cation. And if we look at the enthalpy of hydration, which is a summary of the water molecule and how it undergoes energy change, 
the enthalpy of hydration for a sodium cation is negative 410. So a very exothermic process compared to larger ionic radiuses of the same charge. If we look at group of 2A, the alkaline earth metals, they are all positively two charged in an ion form. Then we have magnesium, which has the smallest ionic radius. And this is a result of this smaller ionic radius. We also have a very exothermic enthalpy of hydration. So from the previous slide, we compared sodium and magnesium and their enthalpy of hydration. Now we're going to look at the anions that we talked about in the last slide. Here we have the fluoride and the bromide anion, and we look at their radius and their resulting enthalpy of hydration. For fluoride, the enthalpy of hydration is negative 431 compared to bromide, which is negative 284. So as we predicted on the previous slide, it's more exothermic for fluoride to form a bond between water and bromide. This is a result of their different ion radiuses. Fluoride has a smaller radius, so it gets closer to the water molecules, compared to bromide, which has a larger ionic radius. In case you thought it was gone, lattice energy is back. We're going to use lattice energy to talk about solution formation. So as a reminder, lattice energy is the energy associated with breaking of an ionic bond, or the energy released when an ionic bond forms. The enthalpy of solute for ionic compounds involves the breaking of that ionic bond or the solute solute interactions. It's the same as that, as that lattice energy we use to talk about the strength of the ionic bond. So our enthalpy of solute will be equal to the enthalpy of lattice energy. Take a moment to finish this equation. The enthalpy of solution, heat, ener heat released or absorbed as a solution forms between an ionic compound and water, is equal to the lattice energy, the energy needed to break the ionic bond, minus the enthalpy of hydration. Pause this video to answer the following questions about lattice energy and hydration. Welcome back from the pause. Now we're going to walk through each question and how we calculate or determine the answer. For number one, we're going to calculate the enthalpy of solution for calcium bromide. As a reminder, to calculate the enthalpy of solution, we're going to take the lattice energy, an endothermic number, and add the enthalpy of hydration of the ions. According to the table, um, the enthalpy of lattice energy and hydration are as follows. The enthalpy of the lattice energy, the energy needed to break the ionic bond, is positive 2,132 kilojoules per mole. The energy released when some calcium and bromide ions are surrounded by water molecules, or the enthalpy of hydration, are both exothermic values. We have one copy of the calcium and two for the bromides, so we have two bromide ions. As we add all these together, using Hess's law of summation, we calculate the enthalpy of solution for calcium bromide as negative 27 kilojoules per mole. We can then draw an enthalpy diagram for this solution process, the calcium bromide dissolving in water. So we're starting with solid calcium bromide, and we have to input lattice energy to break the ions apart. We then take those ions and surround them by water molecules, which resolves in a lot of energy being released in the enthalpy of hydration. Our final enthalpy minus our initial enthalpy gives us an exothermic value of negative 27 kilojoules per mole. We can now examine the interactions that are broken during this process. They are always the same, always solute-solute and solvent-solvent. So both the ionic bond of our solute crystal and the hydrogen bond of our solvent are broken during this process, and one interaction is formed. The ion from the ionic compound makes an ion-dipole interaction with the polar water molecules. We can then do some calculations involving heat and an example of calcium bromide. How much heat is released when 24.3 grams of calcium bromide is dissolved in 500 grams of water? We're going to start with the mass of calcium bromide given and then figure out how many moles are present by dividing by the molar mass. <clears throat> Once we know moles, we can use enthalpy to convert from moles into kilojoules. This is how many kilojoules are released when 24.3 grams of calcium bromide are dissolved in water. Notice that the amount of water present isn't involved in this calculation. If we were to take the initial temperature of the water that we're dissolving our calcium bromide in, 20.0 degrees Celsius, 
we can then predict what the final temperature of our solution will be after that 24.3 grams has dissolved. As a reminder of calorimetry and the first law of thermodynamics, the heat of the absorber the water is equal to the negative heat of the calcium bromide as it dissolves. So instead of a negative 3.3 kilojoules, as we predicted for our solute, we're going to turn it positive for our water solvent and turn it into joules. We can then compare the heat absorbed by the water to its mass, specific heat capacity, and change in temperature. We're concerned with the final temperature, so we're going to solve for a delta T to begin with. The final temperature of our solution will be equal to the heat of water divided by the mass of water and the specific heat capacity of water plus the initial temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. We plug in our numbers, the number of joules to one additional sig, the mass of the water, and the specific heat capacity, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius, and add that to our initial temperature, the temperature of water should increase. And it does to 22 degrees Celsius. We know this number to two significant figures, or to the one size. We've talked about enthalpy. Now we're going to talk about the disorder, or the entropy, the driving force of the solvation process. The energy associated with breaking and forming of bonds and intermolecular forces is only part of our solution story. We also have to talk about how a system uh, has a tendency to spread out its molecules to increase its disorder. The amount of disorder present in a system is called entropy. It's abbreviated with a capital S. As the molecules disperse their kinetic energy and increase their disorder, the entropy of our system can increase. We can consider our states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. We can predict which state of matter would have the most disorder or the most entropy. The entropy of a gas, because the molecules are moving with the highest kinetic energy and the most disorder, is greatest compared to a liquid and a solid. Solids, because crystal structures are formed, have relatively low entropy. We can compute the following equations comparing entropy of vaporization and deposition. If we know the entropy of a gas and a solid, we can compare them by taking a difference to find delta S of vaporization, or the entropy change due to vaporization, going from a liquid to a gas. It's always going to be a positive value, or an increase in disorder when something goes from a liquid to a gas. Deposition, on the other hand, is when we go from a gas to a solid, so we have a substance of high kinetic energy in the gas and low kinetic energy in the solid. If we take our lower entropy of solid and subtract our higher entropy of gas, and the change in entropy during deposition, gas to solid, is always a negative value, where we see a decrease in disorder. Now let's put this together with enthalpy. When a solution forms, our system enters a state of lower enthalpy, or less energy, but also a state of higher disorder, or higher entropy. The relative size of enthalpy and entropy can help us predict whether a solution will form and mixing occurs. A solution will always form when the enthalpy of solution is a negative value or it's exothermic and the disorder is increasing or delta S is a positive number. A solution will form also when the enthalpy of solution is a positive number um, and the increase in entropy is significant or very high. Like in the example of sodium hydroxide, and water mixing. A solution will not form if our enthalpy of solution is positive and the increase in entropy is relatively small. Like in the example of hexane, a nonpolar molecule, and an ionic compound of sodium chloride. So we have to compare the size of our enthalpy and the entropy that is occurring as a result of the solution forming to know whether or not a solution will actually form and solvation will occur. We can also look at solubility, um, which is the maximum amount of solute that could be dissolved in a given amount of solvent at a temperature. Solubility is temperature dependent, and whether a solution is at a high temperature or low temperature will affect how much solute can dissolve in the solvent. Up at the top of the PowerPoint screen, we have a summary of what happens when a solution forms. We have solute and solvent, and when they dissolve together, a solution forms. 
and this is a dynamic equilibrium process, so a solution can also unform or the solvent, solute can recrystallize. We can calculate solubility, an actual value for the number of grams of solute that can dissolve in 100 grams of water with this equation. At higher temperatures, we have a higher solubility for a solute, meaning that the enthalpy of solute and solvent are larger because the molecules are moving faster. A great example of a higher solubility at temperature is when we try and dissolve sugar into tea, to make sweet tea. Um, at higher temperatures, or hot tea, uh, we can dissolve more sugar at that higher temperature than we could in iced tea. Higher temperature for solution, higher solubility. Solutions, as I mentioned, are in dynamic equilibrium, where we have a rate of dissolving versus a rate of crystallization. This process is always occurring, it's dynamic. And there are two major types of solutions that we can talk about in relation to this dynamic equilibrium. We have unsaturated solutions, where less than the maximum amount of solute has been dissolved, and a saturated solution, where we're at the maximum amount of solute present. For an unsaturated solution, we can always dissolve more solute, but in a saturated solution, any amount of solute we add will stay a solid at the bottom of the container and will not be added to the solution. In contrast to saying we only have two types of saturation solutions, we can also talk about supersaturated solutions. These are ones that can fly, so it makes them super. And they're formed by um, heating up a solution and dissolving more than the predicted amount of solute that normally we would have. So we have a higher temperature solvent with a higher solubility of our solute. And as we dissolve more solute at a higher temperature, we can then slowly cool down our solution. The slowly cooling down of our solution allows it to be stable as it decreases its temperature, meaning that our solute will remain dissolved. But this is a relatively unstable solution where we're at the higher, at a larger amount of solute dissolved than we would normally predict with our solubility. If we were to disturb the solution by bumping it or adding something called a seed crystal, um, it allows for the solute to be crystallized in our solution. The point at which the solute starts to form a crystal is called the nucleation site. And what happens is our solution crashes, or we have a rapid production of precipitate in our solution. So we have some pictures here of an unstable solution that's formed in a supersaturated way, and that we have a hot solvent um, that we dissolved a large amount of solute in, and then we either drop a seed crystal or a small crystal into our unstable solution, or we bump it. At the bottom of our, um, our flask, we have a nucleation site, which is where the crystal starts to form as our solute crashes out of solution and forms a solid. Temperature and solubility are related to each other, and depending upon the type of solute, Increasing the temperature will either increase solubility or decreasing the temperature will decrease solubility. Here we have a chart of temperature on the x-axis and solubility in grams of solute per 100 grams of water on the y. And then we have some ionic compounds. In general, we see an increase in temperature paired with an increase in solubility. That is not always the case, like in this example of cesium sulfate. So for a solid liquid solution, in general, solubility increases with increasing temperature, like in the example of sugar dissolved in tea. But due to entropy, some ionic compounds have what's called a retrograde solubility, where as we increase the temperature of the solvent, less solute will actually dissolve. This is a rare case, and cesium sulfate is the major example that's given in our textbook. There are a few more, but in general, as we increase temperature, we increase solubility. We've talked about solids dissolved in liquids to form solutions and their solubility, but we can also talk about the solubility of a gas in a liquid solution. Compared to a solid dissolved in water or in liquid, solubility of a gas will have an inverse proportional solubility compared to temperature. This means that at higher temperatures, less gas is actually dissolved in our solution. A graph is seen here of temperature on the x-axis and solubility on the y-axis. We can compare carbon dioxide and oxygen. As we increase the temperature of the solution, the solubility of our gas decreases. 
This is a result of the gas particles having a higher kinetic energy and a higher temperature and escaping the solution more readily. A great example of solubility of gases and temperature um, can be seen around uh, power plants that heat the water nearby. So here's a power plant um, where extra energy from the plant causes the water in the surrounding area to be warmer. This increase in temperature means there is less gas, both oxygen and carbon dioxide dissolved in water, which uh, marine life need to survive. Because there is less of the oxygen and carbon dioxide gas molecules dissolved in the water, we see less marine life at these higher temperature water spots. The solubility of gas is directly proportional to the pressure that is on the surface of the solution. At higher pressure, we have more gas that is soluble. This is because at a higher pressure on the surface, we can force more gas molecules to leave their gaseous state and enter into the solution. This can be described mathematically with a law called Henry's Law, where the solubility of a gas is equal to some constant times the pressure exerted on the solution. A great example of Henry's Law is what happens when we have carbonated soda. In a closed can, there is a high partial pressure on the surface of the soda, so a lot of carbon dioxide gas has been dissolved. When you open the can and go from a, a situation of high pressure to a situation of low pressure equal to the atmospheric pressure, the solubility of the gas decreases and the gas bubbles leave the solution and exit out of the can, making bubbles appear. Here's another graph showing partial pressure and solubility. Um, as we increase the partial pressure on the surface of a solution, we increase the solubility. So on the left-hand side, we have a low partial pressure and a low solubility. And on the right-hand side, we have a high partial pressure on the surface of the solution and a higher solubility. Pause this video to answer the following questions. Welcome back from the pause. We'll start by looking at number one. What is the partial pressure of nitrogen if 78% of the air contains nitrogen at STP? As a reminder, STP is standard temperature and pressure, which is one set of conditions that many gas calculations are done at. At STP, We have 1.09 atmospheres of pressure, and 0.78% of that pressure belongs to the nitrogen, resulting in a partial pressure of nitrogen. What portion of the pressure is exerted by nitrogen out of everything in the atmosphere is 0.85 atmospheres. I then wonder what the solubility of nitrogen gas will be at one atmosphere if the constant for nitrogen is 0 0.00070 moles per liter's atmosphere at 25 degrees Celsius. Solubility of gas is equal to the solubility constant times the pressure of the gas. In this case, our values are 0 0.00070 moles per liter atmospheres multiplied by atmospheres. The atmospheres will cancel out and we'll know the solubility or the number of moles of gas that will dissolve per liter of solution. 0 0.00060 moles per liter in this case. If we want, we can calculate how many molecules of nitrogen gas are actually dissolved in one liter of water at the conditions given, 25 degrees Celsius and 1.0 atmospheres. We'll start by taking our volume of water, one liter of water, and multiplying by the molarity that we predicted above with one additional sig fig. Once we know many moles, we can convert into number of molecules by multiplying by Avogadro's number. So we took our volume times our molarity times Avogadro's number to calculate the number of molecules of nitrogen that are dissolved at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. In this case, it's 3.6 times 10 to the 20th molecules of nitrogen in that one liter of water. Again, pause the video to try this example question. Welcome back for the pause. We'll start with number one. If we look at that, a situation at the top of Mount Rainier, I wonder what the partial pressure of nitrogen gas will be in atmospheres, where the barometric pressure at the top of this mountain is 17 inches of mercury. The air is still 78% nitrogen gas. We'll start with our unit of pressure, inches of mercury, convert into millimeters of mercury, and then into atmospheres. So our pressure in atmospheres is 0.57 atmospheres. 
We then want to figure out what 78% of this total pressure is, and that will be the partial pressure of just nitrogen. So the partial pressure of nitrogen is 0.78 uh, times our barometric pressure carried to one additional sink. This results in the partial pressure of nitrogen being 0.44 atmospheres. I then wonder what the solubility of nitrogen will be at the top of Rainier, where the pressure of the atmosphere is lower. We have the same constant for nitrogen, 0 0.00070 moles per liter atmosphere. To calculate solubility, we'll take our constant times the pressure of gas we calculated in number one to one additional sig fig. We multiply these numbers together, the atmospheres cancel out, and we just have the solubility, 0 0.00031 moles per liter. We can then calculate how many molecules of nitrogen are dissolved in one liter of water at the top of Mount Rainier with this solubility. We'll start with the volume of water given, and then use the solubility to calculate how many moles of nitrogen have been dissolved in that one liter of water. Then we'll use Avogadro's number, like we did in the previous question, to calculate how many molecules that is. For number three, the answer is 1.9 times 10 to the 20th molecules of nitrogen. In summary, at the top of Mount Rainier, where the pressure of the atmosphere is lower, there is a lower solubility of nitrogen and less molecules dissolved per liter of water than at sea level, where there's a higher atmospheric pressure, a higher solubility for nitrogen, and more molecules dissolved in water. Please pause the video to fill in these blanks. Welcome back from the pause. So you've been asked to complete the following statements to describe how solubility will be affected in the following situations. Number one, if we were to raise the temperature of a saturated solution of calcium nitrate and water, we're going to start with number two. Decreasing the partial pressure on the surface of a solution of nitrogen gas and water will decrease the solubility of the gas. Decreasing the pressure on the surface of a solution causes less gas to be dissolved in water. For number three, if we take an unsaturated solution and we shake it, that will not affect the solubility. We will not be able to dissolve any more or any less solute since our saturation is already at an unsaturated level. If we were to increase the partial pressure on a solution of sodium chloride and water, so increase the pressure of the gas at the surface, my goodness, we're back to number one. Raising the temperature of a saturated solution of calcium nitrate and water will increase the solubility of a calcium nitrate ion, a compound. And number four, uh, if we increase the partial pressure of a solution of sodium chloride and water, that will not affect the solubility. So two things that are unaffected or do not affect the solubility, when we take an unsaturated solution and we shake it, that does not affect how much solid will dissolve in water. And if we were to increase the partial pressure of a gas on the surface of a solution made between a solid and a liquid, we will not affect solubility. Changing the temperature of a saturated solution will increase the solubility of our solid. And decreasing the partial pressure on the surface of the solution of nitrogen and water will decrease the solubility of the gas. Let's look at some concentration units. As a reminder, concentration is a comparison of the amount of solute to the amount of solution. With the expression of molality, which compares solute to solvent, we look at amount of solution in the denominator of our concentration unit. So molarity, as you may recall, is useful for experimentation because it allows us to do stoichiometry calculations with the mole. Molality is useful for experiments where the temperature changes because molality is unrelated to temperature. We also have some percentages like weight volume percentage or a per 100 comparison of solute and solvent, like the mass percent, mass volume percent, and volume volume percent. The percentage used is based on the state of matter of our solute and our solvent. Finally, we have part per thousand, or part per million, or part per billion. It's a similar ratio to our, our percentages, but instead of per 100, it's per thousand, million, and billion. This is used typically for very low concentration situations, like the amount of gold in seawater. As we talk about ionic compounds and covalent compounds being dissolved in water, we can talk about properties of electrolytes. There are three different types of electrolyte solutions. One ionic compound is dissolved in water to produce ions, 
the ions present allow for electricity to be conducted through the solution. If a solution is made between a compound and water and no ions form, we call that a non-electrolyte solution. Since there are no ions present, electricity cannot be conducted through that solution. We also have a weak electrolyte solution where an ion and compound dissolves in water, but only a few of the ion and compounds actually separate into ions. The presence of a few ions means that we have a weak electrolyte solution where a small amount of electricity can be conducted across the solution. And finally, we have a strong electrolyte solution where when an ion and compound dissolves in water, many ions are formed. The presence of many ions means that a large amount of electricity can be conducted across this ion and compound in its solution form. Now that we've talked about concentration, molarity, and electrolytes, we can talk about the molarity of electrolyte solutions. So for non-electrolyte solutions and strong electrolytes, all of the particles dissolve in solution. Please pause the video to answer the following question. Welcome back from the pause. When we have 38 grams of an ionic compound, potassium phosphate, and we dissolve it into one liter of water, I wonder what the molarity of the different parts of our solution will be. We're going to start with our 38 grams of potas uh, potassium phosphate. Divide by the molar mass to figure out how many moles of the whole compound we have dissolved in water. This results in 0.18 moles of potassium phosphate dissolved in water. So the molarity of the whole compound in water is 0.18 molar. The number of moles divided by the one liter. If we were to look at the molarity of just each individual ion, potassium versus phosphate, we first need to write a dissociation equation where we take our solid ionic compound and break it into the number of moles of each ion present. So for every one mole of potassium phosphate that dissolves, we make three moles of potassium and one mole of phosphate. This results in the molarity of potassium cation being three times as much as the molarity of the whole compound, but the molarity of the phosphate ion being the same as the molarity of the compound. This is all due to the ratio of moles, one mole is the compound for every three moles of ion and one mole of anion. For weak electrolytes, because a compound dissociates only partially, the molarity of the solute is complicated. It depends on a variety of factors, including the equilibrium of the dissociation of the weak electrolyte. And we're gonna talk more about this in Chem 163. 